Good evening and welcome to From the Stacks with the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. I'm Cornwall President Calvin Beisner. Thanks very much for joining us tonight. Our guest tonight will be Dr. Ross McKittrick, who is a professor of economics at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. I'll have a bit more information about him for you shortly. Uh, what is it that makes cutting carbon dioxide emissions so difficult? We've been working at it. Uh, company, country, countries all over the world have been working at this for some 30 years and essentially have achieved nothing. Uh, what benefits would come from our cuts in carbon dioxide emissions, if any? Would they exceed the costs? And what does economic growth have to do with causing global warming and adapting to it? What good comes from CO2 emissions? You might wonder whether any good poss could possibly come from them. Well, stick with us and we'll talk about those and lots of other questions with Ross McKittrick shortly. Uh, before we go there, I would like to just inform you that the Cornwall Alliance, the Search of Creation, a little bit, network of uh, evangelical Christian scholars, about a third are natural scientists, a third are economists, and a third are theologians and philosophers or various people with similar uh, callings. And our task, our mission is to educate the public and policymakers about three things simultaneously and interwoven. The first one is what we call biblical earth stewardship, different a little bit from environmentalism, but it, it has the shared concern of wanting to take good care of this earth over which God has given humankind dominion. Uh, we want to exercise a godly dominion, which we think uh, looks like men and women working together to enhance the fruitfulness and the beauty and the safety of the earth to the glory of God and to the benefit of our neighbors, so that we're really addressing the two great commandments to love God and to love neighbor. Our second major issue is economic development for the very poor around the world. Uh, think especially of places like Sub-Saharan Africa and some parts of Asia and Latin America. Uh, where living standards are very, very low and uh, disease and mortality are much higher than in advanced countries of the world. Uh, we want to ask and answer the question, what is it that lifts and keeps whole societies, not isolated individuals, but whole societies out of poverty? And uh, there are lots and lots of parts to the answer, but they can all sort of boil down to two things. The first is a set of social institutions, uh, private property rights, uh, free trade, limited government, the rule of law, uh, and entrepreneurship. Uh, you put those social institutions together with a physical constraint, a, a physical uh, requirement, and that is access to reliable, abundant, affordable energy, uh, and whole societies can rise and stay out of poverty. Without either of those, uh, they can't. And so we want to make sure that, uh, that policymakers around the world understand this and that the public understands it as well. Our third area of concern is to teach about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that sinners, people like me, can be reconciled to a holy God <clears throat> by his grace um, demonstrated to us and uh, working in our behalf uh, in Christ's death on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins and his provision to us of his own righteousness so that we can be adjudged righteous in God's sight, not by any goodness of our own, but by the goodness of Christ. Not only this gospel, but also the worldview, the theology, and the ethics that come along with this, we seek to integrate with the science and the economics of our other uh, major areas of concern uh, to guide in policy preferences. Uh, so that's basically what the Cornwall Alliance is, and we try to educate through things like this live stream program, our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, our uh, website, cornwallalliance.org. And uh, by the way, pretty much every month, uh, as a way of saying thank you to the donors who enable us to do what we do, because we are a nonprofit, 501c3 nonprofit organization, dependent entirely on gifts from private individuals, 
uh, as our way of saying thank you, we offer some sort of a, uh, an educational tool. This month, our tool is a newly published booklet of my own called Biblical Foundations for Economics. Uh, this is a, a fairly short book, about 56 pages, but I think it really brings together a lot of insights fairly quickly in terms of how to see the Bible as providing ethical foundations, moral foundations, for our understanding of economic relationships in business, in trade, in the ownership and use of property, and in uh, how we relate to others' property, including through the activities of government. So I would be delighted to send uh, anyone who requests this a free copy of Biblical Foundations for Economics as our say, uh, way of saying thank you. When you make a donation, totally 100% tax deductible donation of literally any size, doesn't matter how small or how large, of course, we'd love for it to be a large donation, uh, to the Cornwall Alliance. To do this, just go to cornwallalliance.org, click on the donate button, and then as you fill out the donation form, when you come to the comments field, uh, enter promo code 21-10, that's promo code 21-10, and the title, Biblical Foundations for Economics, and we'll be glad to send you a copy of this absolutely free. I hope that uh, if you get it, you'll not only read it yourself, but also share it with others, share it with family members, share it with neighbors. I'd especially love to see you share it with pastors and elders or deacons at your church. Uh, this is something that I think that many people could find very helpful. So again, welcome to From the Stacks, uh, named for the fact that I do my part in it from among the stacks of my library, a little bit of what you see back behind me there. And our guest tonight, again, is uh, Dr. Ross McKittrick. Ross is a good friend of mine for, what, Ross, probably going back nearly 20 years now. And uh, Yeah, about 20 years, I would say. Yeah. He's at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. He specializes in environmental economics and, frankly, in, in statistical analysis that just leaves me dumbfounded. Uh, the, his abilities in that are truly extraordinary. Uh, he's published widely on the economics of pollution, climate change, and public policy. His book, Economic Analysis of Environmental Policy, was published by the University of Toronto Press in 2010. And his background in applied statistics has led to his collaborative work across a wide range of topics in the physical sciences, including paleoclimate reconstruction, malaria transmission, uh, surface temperature measurement, and climate model evaluation. Uh, Dr. McKittrick has made many invited academic presentations around the world and has testified before the U.S. Congress and committees of the Canadian House of Commons and Senate. He's been a prominent expert reviewer for the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the assessment reports that they put out every oh, typically five or six years or so. Uh, he's been doing that through uh, since the mid 1990s, is that right, Ross? I think. Yep. Yep. Uh, no, yeah. no, not that far back. Um, early part of the last decade is really when I got involved. Okay. So, all right. Uh, so you were involved uh, at least in AR four and five, I think, right? Uh, yeah, it would have been, right. that's right. The third assessment report was the hockey stick report. And, uh, I started yeah. getting involved after that one. After that. Right. And in fact, the hockey yeah. stick was a little bit of why you got involved. Uh, Ross and mm -hmm. his, uh, his friend and colleague, Stephen McIntyre exposed the famous hockey stick graph as a, uh, as filled with faulty or driven by faulty data and really improper statistical methods. I think that's really what got you and Steve out in the public eye so much and uh, certainly certainly captured my attention, led to, was that the first time that you testified before a U.S. congressional committee was uh, on that topic? Uh, 
Well, um, actually, Steve testified. I, I didn't go and testify on, on that topic. Oh. So, um, okay. I my, uh, my experience testifying was, uh, was on, on um, other topics related okay. to climate All still. Right. But. <clears throat> yeah, still related to climate. Well, anyway, Ross, thank you so much for doing the show with us tonight. Um, this show is going to be a little different from most of ours. Uh, usually we do a back and forth uh, dialogue sort of thing all the way through the program. But tonight, after just a moment, I'm going to essentially turn it over to you, Ross. Uh, and folks, Ross is going to do a PowerPoint presentation for us uh, that I have previously seen. And I just think it's so outstanding. I want you all to see it uh, yourselves. But Ross, first, uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, how you got into this sort of thing, and and uh, maybe maybe go in a little bit into what it is like to be an expert reviewer for the IPCC. But put that at the tail end. Uh, well, um, I was interested in economics from pretty much from when I started university, and I uh, ended up doing um, a PhD in the subject at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and uh, started teaching at the University of Guelph in 1996 in environmental economics. And in those days, I didn't really know a lot about climate change. I taught and studied the issue of carbon taxes. That was an interesting economics mm -hmm. topic. Um, but it was a few years later, um, I, and I think actually it, was, it would have been at a the, the founding, the, the meeting out of which the Cornwall Alliance developed um, mm -hmm. in uh, Cornwall, Connecticut, I think that's where the term, yeah. the name comes from. Yep. Um, when uh, I first saw someone make mention of the weather satellite data, and that it wasn't showing what the surface temperature data was showing. And, and at that point, I'd already seen lots of presentations on the science of climate change, but it had never occurred to me that there are other ways of measuring it. And, and uh, I just wondered, well, why haven't I been told this before? This seems kind of important. And uh, that got me curious about what else maybe I'm not being told. So I just started looking for myself at the data sources and information sources. And um, as the uh, Kyoto debate was heating up in Canada, I began speaking out about the economic problems with the Kyoto Protocol. And uh, not many people in Canada were working on the issue at the time. So I, I got a fair amount of public profile around that. And uh, um, after that, I began doing some work on temperature data issues and um, got involved, as you mentioned, with Stephen McIntyre. And we, uh, we dug into the hockey stick data. And um, uh, I've, so I've continued ever since then, not only to be working on the economic issues, but also um, to be doing a lot of work on statistical analysis related to climate and most recently have published a paper looking at some flaws in the uh, way the IPCC performs attribution analysis to connect observed climate changes to greenhouse gases. Um, now, you, you asked about the IPCC. I, I was asked uh, at the time of the fourth assessment report, that would have been 2005, I think they started working on that, to put in expert review comments. And I've been an expert reviewer ever since then, most recently for the sixth assessment report. And uh, the first volume of that just came out in August. And um, after working as a reviewer for the IPCC, I also did some academic writing on the IPCC procedures and tried to explain to people that it's not what what people often think. It's not the um, uh, the rigorous review process that they like to claim. But, um, the uh, a, a lot of times, yes, they get reviewers from different perspectives, but a lot of our review comments don't have any impact. The, uh, the, the lead authors in the end get to decide what it is the report's going to say, regardless of what the review comments say. And um, hmm. so people should understand that, yes, there can be a lot of useful information and a lot of work goes into preparing them. But when it's something that's subject to any real controversy or, or um, uh, disputed interpretation, 
um, the the lead authors really get the final say in it, and no. the reviewers no. um, may not have any influence on on what what goes into it. So, I uh, they like to claim that you know there are hundreds or thousands of scientists involved in writing these reports, but the fact is um, they. It's not like everybody agrees on what should be in the report. It's always down to a small group of people that decide that. Yeah, what is, I, I think something like about a dozen and a half people really wind up be, being really in control of the outcome, output. Um, but you, of course, are among the, what is it? I think it's around 5,000 scientists that claim contribute to the reports. And I have a feeling that an awful lot of those, a lot of those are simply a matter of, well, they were listed as co-authors of some of the articles that got cited in the report. Uh, but so tell us just a little bit about the review process. How does that work uh, as an expert reviewer? Um, well, the, there's an organization called the IPCC Bureau, which is in Geneva, and they put together the authorship teams uh, that will generate the drafts of the report. And then the chapters are made available for review. Um, when, the, when the draft is ready for review, um, the people who are qualified as reviewers are, are allowed to access the chapter drafts, and you have about six weeks to prepare review. And um, so you have to use a certain format. It's all put into a spreadsheet. And um, so you can comment on whichever chapters uh, you choose and um, uh, put, put your comments in. Uh, the, uh, there's, there's one round of review that um, you, you comment on, and then a revised version of the draft goes out. And you can, if you want, comment on it as well. And um, if, as, as in my case, if um, you aren't satisfied that they took account of your review comments the second time around, um, you can repeat the review comments or add further challenges to what's there. In some cases, and I know this happened with the most recent report, um, there are some people that put in review comments and then when they, the second draft came out and nothing had changed, they just gave up and didn't bother putting in further review comments. And, um, but you put in your, if you do choose to review the second draft, those comments go in and then the review process is finished, but the chapter will still go through a further round of revisions and those revisions aren't sent to the scientific reviewers. So, um, yeah. It's there is a there is reviewer input, but it's not like typical academic review where at a, a good quality academic journal, you review the submission, you can reject it if you think it's it's not good enough, or you can require revisions, but um, the author doesn't get to make changes after the the final draft. The um, yeah. The review process is set up so that authors aren't able to make changes before publication that aren't themselves subject to review. Yeah, okay. Um, one way that I often will put it to people about the assessment reports that come out from the IPC is that there's actually an awful lot of really good science in them, uh, or at least, mm -hmm. you know, review of science. And they're, they're not doing the science themselves directly, but they're reviewing uh, what is out in the scientific literature. There's a lot of good information in there, uh, but that somehow from the collecting of that information and summarizing it and so on to getting what comes out in front of policymakers and then what comes out to the media and to the public, uh, you tend to get a huge exaggeration of uh, always in the direction of uh, more of a sense of crisis than what the actual uh, substantial information in the reports would support. Is, is that, am I being fair that way? Yeah, I think that's a, a fair comment. Um, if you look at topics, uh, like tropical cyclones, for instance, um, over the past few IPCC reports, they have declined to claim that there's a, a, 
an observable upward trend in the, the number or the intensity of tropical cyclones and also decline to make a connection to greenhouse gases. And that's still there in the sixth assessment report. Um, but now what they, they like to emphasize is that, um, yes, we don't observe a pattern historically, but the models say we're going to get more of them in the future. So they're putting more emphasis on model projections. So there are some topics yeah. like um, I did a lot of work about a decade ago on problems with the surface temperature record, the contamination, urbanization, things like that. And yeah. I think there are a lot of unresolved issues with the surface thermometer network data. And the IPCC has just never really been able to come to terms with that. They, uh, um, this was one of the themes in the climate gate emails that they were determined yeah. to keep this information out of the report. And in this current report, um, there's almost no discussion of it. I tried to inject um, some critical comments and um, even where they do make claims and they don't have any uh, cited sources to back it up. I explained where those claims are um, originated from and it's not in this scientific literature, um, but uh, for you know, they have their reasons. Uh, they didn't take any of that into account in that section of the report, I think, is uh, mm -hmm. is an indication of what you're saying, that when it's it's a controversial topic and it kind of gets in the way of the message that they want to put out, um, they will work around the, uh, the literature if they have to. Um, and I mentioned ClimateGate, and, and it does go back to uh, 20 years ago and, and beyond when IPCC authors perceive that there is a message that uh, the sponsors want to get out and the report has to back them up on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, after that introduction, let's go ahead and, and switch directly to your presentation. Take all the time you need on it. I, I hope that we've left you plenty. We do not have a hard end time for this. You might. so. Do you okay. know, suit yourself, oh. uh, but I really appreciate your helping our viewers understand how that whole system works before you dive into this uh, presentation, which I think is just wonderful. So go ahead, it's yours. Okay. Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do now is switch over to my slides, and this is always the perilous part of these events. <laughs> um, I, I hope that uh, there you go. I'm switching over to my slides, I don't completely demolish a connection here, pull a Facebook on you and go completely offline or something. <laughs> um, now, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, good. Then um, let me know if uh, there's a glitch. But otherwise, um, the title of my talk is When Emo Climate Policy When Emotion Meets Reality. And um, now, uh, on my screen, I just see the slide. But if people are seeing me and I'm in the way of the slide, I think there's a button on the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can push, uh, click on on the um, I, little icon there, I think and that will cause seeing, me to disappear. I think people are seeing only the screen, so I think you're fine now. All right. So. Um, We've got 29 years and counting since um, the 1992 Rio conference, which uh, set the agenda for uh, climate policy ever since. And then the Kyoto Protocol, 1997, the Paris Climate Treaty of 2015. Um, lots of diplomatic and policy activity over the past nearly 30 years. And that's the result. So that's um, global CO2 emissions and um, as you look at that graph, try to spot the years that the treaties came into force. Um, it just hasn't had the effect that um, the proponents of, of these policies had hoped for. Um, now, it is true that CO2 per unit of GDP, the gross domestic product, the standard measure of the size of the economy, CO2 per unit of GDP is falling, but again, at a pretty steady rate. So if you look at that graph, it's again, it's not obvious where those treaties were signed. The trajectory is in the direction uh, that people had in mind when they 
develop these treaties, but um, that downward tra trajectory is really indicating improvements in energy efficiency over time. Um, now, by contrast, other types of air pollution have been reduced quite a bit. And I'll show you here data from Canada. Data from the United States would look very similar. Um, so the top graph is emissions of fine particulate matter by source from 1990 to 2014. And you can see just a, a steady downward trend, even though, and this is the Canadian economy, you've got rapid economic growth, uh, comparatively speaking, over this interval. Uh, the bottom graph is sulfur dioxide by source, uh, again, over a 25-year interval there. While the economy is growing, emissions are going down. So other types of air pollution, and I could show you lots of graphs that look like that, um, but CO2 is different. And so we have to ask, why is CO2 so difficult to reduce? And I'll go through a bunch of reasons. Uh, the first is that the emissions mix globally. So unilateral action here is useless. Um, and by mixing globally, what I mean is we're really only interested in the global total. Um, with the other types of air pollution, the local emissions matter. The, um, the uh, emissions where you live makes a big difference, but not with CO2. Second is the carbon cycle, which is um, how CO2 mixes in the atmosphere, is massive and slow moving. So any benefits that we might expect from CO2 emission reductions are going to be very small and they will occur far in the future. The third is that emissions of CO2, unlike the other types of emissions, are closely tied to fossil fuel use. And fossil fuel use is an essential element of economic growth and development. And they can't be decoupled at this point. Second or fourth, um, abatement options are very limited for CO2, not the case for the other types of pollutants, but for CO2, uh, abatement options are very limited. And then finally, when we ask what's the downside of CO2, well, the damages are highly uncertain. They're not typically measurable and they may not even appear for decades. And again, that's different from particulates. If you live in a place with very high particulate emissions, you can see out your window what the damages are, what the problems are. But CO2, uh, different story. Okay, so going to the first point, emissions mix globally. Um, because we're only interested in the global average concentration of carbon dioxide, everybody is a contributor, everybody is responsible for a bit. Some, co some countries like Canada are responsible for an extremely small amount, but then countries like the US and China are responsible for more. But even still, no one country can, on its own, change the total emissions in any one year. And that leads to what economists call the leakage problem. Now, the leakage problem happens if one country or one region decides to cut their emissions. And we would typically do that by putting in place policies that will restrict industrial or economic activity in some respect, that activity doesn't necessarily disappear. It may just pick up and move somewhere else. So if you have factories closed down in a country that's put strict climate policies in place and that operation just moves to China or India or somewhere else, then you haven't reduced emissions. You've just moved the emitting activity somewhere else. And that's called carbon leakage. Leakage rates can be quite large. Um, the, the research on leakage rates, of course, it goes back many decades. I remember studying it as a graduate student in the early 1990s because was, it was a concern even then. Um, and it's hard to track down exactly how big the effect is. Um, some types of activity isn't very mobile, so you might have fairly low leakage rates. But when you have a lot of capital mobility, leakage rates can even be over 100%, meaning you shut down emitting activity in a place like the United States and you reopen the same activity in China. But in China, the electricity source is much more coal intensive. So the same amount of economic activity might have an even higher emissions profile. So your leakage rate may be over 100% in that case. Going to the carbon cycle. Um, the carbon cycle uh, is the the full mixing process of CO2 in and out of the atmosphere. And um, 
the the total amount of CO2 emissions globally is a fairly small fraction of the stock of CO2 that's in the atmosphere. And um, the stock of CO2 that's in the atmosphere is gradually cycled into the oceans. The CO2 is absorbed into the water and into the land as trees and plants grow each year. And then they also die each year and in dying, they release their CO2 back to the atmosphere. And so this is a massive cycling in and out of, of uh, CO2 in and out of the atmosphere. And it's in the context of that massive cycle that we have a small injection each year from our CO2 emissions from fossil fuel use. That being the case, we can look at what would happen uh, to the CO2 level in the atmosphere if we complied with the policies that are proposed. And going back to the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, it's been clear from the modeling work that's been done that full compliance with a big treaty like Kyoto or the Paris Treaty turns out would only slightly slow down the rate of accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, the concentration that we would expect to hit in the year 2100, we'd still get there. We'd get there maybe in 2105 instead. It is not the case that the policies that we're talking about would stop the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere and certainly wouldn't reduce it. And yet, Kyoto was too costly to implement and very few countries complied, including Canada. We had ambitious emission reduction targets, but um, neither conservative nor liberal governments here were willing to implement the policies necessary to meet those targets. And same in Europe and the United States and other countries, Japan, Kyoto was too costly to implement and countries bailed out on it. So you have a situation where um, a policy that wouldn't actually have done much was still too expensive to implement. And countries are not on track to meet their Paris commitments either. I know there's um, more aggressive policies being proposed this time, but in terms of actual emissions, countries are not on track to meet the Paris commitments. Let's look more closely at the Kyoto Protocol. What would the effects have been? This is from a study that was done shortly after the Kyoto Protocol was signed, and it, rep it shows model simulations of various scenarios for the future. And um, so let's look at what happens if we assume full compliance with the Kyoto Protocol. Um, that bottom panel shows the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere under various scenarios, and the top black line there is what happens if we don't do anything, no Kyoto. Um, and under the assumptions that it's running with as far as emissions, um, you go from 350 parts per million in 1990 up to about 700 parts per million by the year 2100. That's without any policy. Now, what happens if everybody who signed up for Kyoto does everything they promised they're going to do? Well, that's the next line down. That's that little dotted line. And uh, it's very hard to see the gap between those lines. Um, so let me zoom in a bit closer and what happens is that the uh, concentration that we would reach in say the year 2090 we get there about five years later so all that's happened full compliance with the kyoto protocol is we just slow down the process a little bit those other lines are what would happen if we went beyond kyoto and had much more stringent policies and even still you can see uh, it's just slowing down the rate of accumulation. Now, the Paris Climate Treaty picture is just the same. This is from a, a study by Bjorn Lomborg. And in this case, uh, he's looking at uh, temperature effects. Um, the graph of CO2 concentration would look very similar. But the top line is what happens if we do nothing under a fairly extreme scenario of called RCP 8.5. And then the blue line underneath it, you can barely see uh, the gap. That's, um, that's everything people promise under Paris. And then the green line below that is Paris, but more policies for the next 70 years. And so uh, even with extra policies, we only get, in that case, a 0.17 degree change after 
uh, 70 years. So this is the picture that people need to have in mind. We're not talking here about implementing some policy that's going to eliminate CO2 emissions and stop the rate of growth of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's not like sulfur dioxide and acid rain where um, money was spent. It wasn't cheap, but it wasn't all that expensive to put scrubbers in place. And, and they all but eliminated sulfur dioxide emissions as an environmental issue. Um, CO2, different picture. So um, if we're not going to accomplish anything, then we need to ask, okay, well, what are the benefits of CO2 abatement? Why are we doing it? And this is where the rhetoric gets very misleading. So this is where, um, if you put that question out, activists will spin it around and say, yes, but we have to talk about the, top, the cost of inaction. We can't afford not to act. And then they will start listing all the alleged costs of climate change. Um, and what they'll do is throw in every bad weather event they can think of storms and hurricanes and floods and droughts and how much do all those things cost um okay well there's a couple of problems with that first of all nobody claims that those are all caused by greenhouse gases obviously we've always had storms and floods and droughts and hurricanes and all the rest of it um but let's say for the sake of argument that we could identify the costs attributable to CO2 emissions, the costs of global warming um, if there are no abatement policies enacted. So, and let's say we can attach a number to that. I'm not sure we ever could, but let's say we do it. <clears throat> that is not a measure of the benefits of the abatement policy. It's misleading to then say, well, look at how expensive global warming is. So obviously we have to implement this policy. What we then have to do is do the same calculation, but uh, with a realistic assessment of how that cost estimate would change once we've implemented all the abatement policies. And if you do that, what we end up with is almost the same number. Maybe there's a little difference between the two, but um, given the graphs that I just showed you, when we, we don't stop the CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere, all we do is slow it down slightly. That means if you think that those CO2 emissions are going to cause a lot of harmful weather events, we're still going to get almost all of them over the next hundred years. So when we go to measure the benefits of abatement, the comparison here has to be based on the actual projected effect of the policy. Okay, so then what would be the benefit of Kyoto or Paris or a policy like that? From an economic point of view, it is the discounted present value of a slight delay in reaching CO2 doubling. Discounting meaning we have to take account of the fact that it's not going to happen for a long way into the future. So uh, we, we apply financial discounting to that number. Um, that's, that's what we're actually talking about. Now, a lot of the rhetoric here is on the misguided basis that there's some option open to us that would, quote, stop climate change or even, quote, take action on the climate. That kind of rhetoric just isn't meaningful because we aren't talking about policies. No one has ever proposed policies that would stop global warming. All we ever talk about are policies that would, if everybody does everything they say they're going to do, it would just change the timing by a small amount. So um, as a result, um, it's very difficult to point to, to real benefits of these policies. If we're going to approach it as a policy problem, the policies need to be implemented on a very large scale, even to show up in the models, to have a noticeable effect in the models. No, one, As I, I say, no one has ever proposed or even could conceive of a policy that would stop climate change. And the policies that we have talked about are too small to have an effect, and yet they've been too costly to implement. So should we then scale those same policies up? Well, the problem is when you scale up those policies, the costs go up faster than the benefits. And this is the fundamental barrier to large scale climate policy that at, a, at the scale that we, we talk about, they don't have any effect and they're too expensive. If we try to ramp up the scale under current technology, 
given our current technology, um, the costs ramp up way faster than the benefits. And um, if there's anyone watching this who is still unconvinced that, well, now it's different. Everybody agrees we've got to take lots of action. I just turn your attention to what's happening in Europe right now with um, some uh, shortage of supply of fossil energy. And the policy reaction around that is panic. They are going to do everything they can. They are getting coal, they're getting natural gas, they can get anything there that they can get their hands on to keep the lights on and keep their economies running. And China has made commitments to reduce its CO2 emissions. I'm not sure that they're very credible commitments, but they're also running short on coal. And um, notwithstanding their claims that they were going to stop importing coal from, from Australia, they have just opened up the ports and they're bringing in the coal and they are getting coal and natural gas and oil as fast as they can and they've said they'll get it whatever the cost is because uh energy is necessary so um moving on to the third topic um emissions co2 emissions are very closely tied to growth and this ties in with what i was just talking about so if we look at the high emission growth scenarios that the ipcc has put forward um i showed you the R rcp 8.5 uh, in the, the Lombard chart. Uh, so that's an example of potentially several degrees of warming by 2100. Oh, a large amount Ross, of climate change. Ross, yeah. can I interrupt for just a moment? Explain for sure. our listeners what RCP stands for in terms of RCP 8.5. Sure. Um, so uh, the IPCC, in order to do projections of climate change, they need assumptions about what future emissions will be like and so they have a library of these emission scenarios and um the the library is called the representative concentration pathways or rcp and um, there are low and mid-range scenarios and i will show you um some some data on these but they also have some that are extremely high end. And the one that gets the most attention is called RCP 8.5. And it, it projects extremely high rates of emissions, including large increases in, in coal use that a lot of energy experts think there, there just isn't enough coal in the ground to make that one realistic. So um, the, but um, people still use the high end RCP scenario um, just to, to look and see, well, what would happen if we had this, this high emission scenario? So, um, and the answer obviously enough is you'd have a lot of warming in the climate models. So, um, so that's um, the typical result of running a model with the RCP scenario. But something that doesn't get mentioned here is Along with that, you get a massive amount of economic growth, including developing countries, our current poor countries, would be almost 70 times wealthier by the year 2100 than they are today. So if you think for a minute about what happens if countries with a thousand or two thousand dollars annual per capita income are 70 times wealthier, that's that's 70 to 140 thousand dollars per capita income in in uh, inflation adjusted income. Well, um, that would be, uh, that would be great. I and mean, the only word for that is that would solve every development problem known to humanity. It would mean we have not only eliminated poverty, but the poorest countries today would look like, uh, the U S would look like Europe as far as, um, wealth goes. And, well, the world would still have lots of problems, of course, but as far as poverty and development and things like that, we would be talking about a world where those problems are all solved. So um, you have to put those two things together. When we talk about a high emission scenario, um, yes, you get the warming, but you also solve every other economic development problem. And how do we know that's a worst case scenario? I mean, really? Um, is yes it's it's uh it's hard to kind of picture it but um it's not obvious to me that we should just assume that that's the worst case scenario to be avoided at all costs 
the underlying issue here is emissions are tied to growth and developing countries know that their growth depends on access to abundant inexpensive energy and right now with our current technology that means fossil fuels um, now the good news here is that emissions growth uh, tends to be much lower than groups like the IPCC keep projecting. So if you look at this chart here, this is a really interesting chart. It was put together uh, two years ago for a paper and the authors buried it in a, a, an appendix. They didn't draw much attention to it, but it certainly caught my eye. The, um, the black line there on the graph is the observed increase in uh, CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. And, and unfortunately, the numbers there are cut off, but uh, it starts at about 320 parts per million and it goes up to about 400 parts per million um, at the end of the chart there. And all the way along from 1970 onward, um, people have been making emission projections and projecting what the resulting CO2 concentration is going to be in the atmosphere. And that's what those colored lines look like. So um, now back in 1970, the, the numbers are offset a little bit there, but if you mentally just move that spread of blue lines up uh, a little bit, you'll see that the only line that goes up at the right rate is the bottom most one. The other ones all over project the growth of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. And then you move to the 1980s uh, where the lines are in green and it's the same thing. The, the numbers just keep overshooting um, except for that one line in 1988. Uh, that was from a study where they didn't put that in as a realistic projection. They were just saying in their model for comparison purposes what would happen if you capped CO2 in the atmosphere. That, so that's not a projection. And then in the 1990s, you have the orange lines. And again, same picture. The uh, bottom most projection is the only one that turns out to be realistic. The others are all exaggerated. And then the same in the year 2000s. You can't really see it uh, in the graph there. but um, And there's other evidence of the same sort that shows that this whole set of scenarios, these RCP scenarios, the only ones that actually match um, the current and projected energy market data are at the low end. So and this is an important thing to keep in mind because most of the times you read newspaper articles about what's going to happen under climate change, they're based on high end scenarios that we already know are obsolete, that, that don't match the data. And it's part of a pattern that for whatever reason, people working in this discipline just keep overstating the rate of growth of CO2 in the atmosphere. And then they publish studies that say, you know, within 30 years, ice caps will be gone or something like that. And it always hits the papers, but you, you don't even need to read any depth into that article. You know that they're based on overstated emission scenarios. Now, what follows from that is uh, temperatures rise less than models project. And there are several reasons for this. Some of it is the scenarios are off, but also the models themselves are too responsive to CO2 levels. So the graph on the left there, that's from uh, Spencer and Christie looking at comparison of sea surface temperatures. Um, that's the, the thick black line, the observed sea surface temperatures, and they go up. There's an upward trend there, but compare that to what the models project should have happened and that's over the historical interval. So we can compare models to observations. And obviously the models by and large are projecting too much warming. And that's the sea surface temperature. The graph on the right is the global low, lower troposphere. That's from a paper John Christie and I published. Uh, the blue line there is the average of uh, the satellite data and the individual gray lines. Those are separate mo uh, climate model. Uh, reconstructions of that interval and then the black line is the average of the models and so e even over a fairly short interval that's 1979 to 2014 the models just move off the observations they have too much warming going on in them so um, when we think about global warming scenarios at this point it's a very safe assumption to say 
Okay, let's look at the low end emission scenarios. And also let's use the lower sensitivity models and that's gonna give us a more real picture. All right, back to this issue of abatement options. Um, CO2 is closely tied to the use of fossil fuels. So combustion, that's where we get energy from fossil fuels. Combustion mainly releases water vapor and carbon dioxide. And um, it also releases particulates and sometimes sulfur and a few other things, but you can put um, equipment on a combustion engine to capture the particulates and to reduce the other types of emissions. So your car has a catalytic converter on it. It's a remarkable device. Uh, you don't even know it's there. It's just a, a unit that's on the, the, in the exhaust system and it substantially reduces the particulates and the carbon monoxide and the volatile organic compounds coming out of the tailpipe. And then as a result of, of catalytic converters, we now drive a lot more than we ever used to, but levels of carbon monoxide and other motor vehicle related emissions have plummeted in North America and in Europe. Similarly, we can put scrubbers on smokestacks and that captures most of the particulates and sulfur, but neither of these technologies stop the CO2 from being released. Uh, there's no scrubber for CO2 and there's no catalytic converter for CO2. The CO2 is released as a gas Sometimes it can be captured as a gas, but then you got to figure out where to put it. It can be pumped underground into the storage caverns, but that's very expensive and there's only a limited number of places you can, you can hope to do that. So for the most part, um, the use of fossil fuels means CO2 emissions. And then the only way to cut CO2 emissions is to cut the fuel use. And so, um, that means um, you got to ask people to use less energy or at least less of the, the most inexpensive and abundant forms of energy. Now, sometimes policymakers pin their hope on energy efficiency and prescribing energy efficiency rules. Um, mandates for, you know, switching to curly light bulbs and things like that. If you like them, that's fine. Go ahead and use them. But um, mandates to force people to adopt energy efficiency appliances, uh, they're particularly inefficient for reducing CO2 emissions for a couple of reasons. First of all, they're only weakly connected to emissions. I mean, here in Ontario, we have a lot of energy efficiency regulations, but our electricity supply is mostly nuclear and hydro. We use uh, a little bit of natural gas, but for the most part, it doesn't matter how much or how little electricity you use in a place like Ontario, it doesn't affect uh, CO2 emissions. Now in the US, you have more fossil fuel um, than we do, but even still um, energy efficiency mandates, even if they reduce your energy use, don't necessarily reduce CO2 emissions by much. And then there's something called the rebound effect. And that uh, is that if you introduce a rule that says, okay, you gotta go buy an expensive LED light bulb, but it uses very little electricity. Um, once it's installed, people will compensate by using the same appliance much more than they use the old one. So if you have a more efficient light bulb, you leave the lights on longer. If you have more efficient TV, people watch more TV. Um, and there's now empirical evidence that this rebound effect where people respond to an improvement in energy efficiency by increasing their consumption of energy, it's basically 100%. So this is a study that came out earlier this year very detailed empirical analysis of, of the rebound effect. What they found in uh, US data is that after about four years, the rebound effect is around 100%, which means, okay, you can force people to adopt more energy efficient appliances, but after about four years with the new appliances, their increased energy consumption has fully offset the, uh, the energy savings. So, that's also a dead end as far as policy goes. Unfortunately, policymakers are going to keep pushing costly energy efficiency rules in the name of climate change, but it's, it's not going to reduce CO2 emissions. Okay. So let's step back now and say, okay, we've, we've sort of taken 
a broad view that says it's going to be really costly, really difficult to reduce CO2 emissions. If you do it on a large scale, it won't have much effect, but it will cost a lot. Um, and at a certain point, people are entitled to ask, um, what's in it for me if we reduce CO2 emissions? What's, what's the actual harm from CO2 emissions that we're trying to avoid? Nobody thought of regulating CO2 um, historically because it's not an air pollutant in the usual sense of the term. It's, it's a natural part of the atmosphere. You exhale CO2 emissions. The outdoor concentration is about 400 parts per million. The breath that you exhale is about 40,000 parts per million. Most uh, office buildings or homes, if you spend all day in the home with a group of people, the concentration of CO2 will be up to 800 to 1,000 parts per million. Um, it's not harmful. And it's good for plants. Um, CO2 is plant food. And so um, it's never been regulated as an air pollutant. We've been regulating particulates and sulfur and carbon monoxide for many decades in Canada and the United States, but not CO2 because it's not an air pollutant and it doesn't have harmful health effects, at least unless you get up to <clears throat> extremely high concentrations, which we're not talking about here. Um, and CO2 has contributed to the greening of the earth. So there's a lot more plant matter and a lot larger forests and a lot healthier grasslands and um, extensive evidence from uh, satellite studies and from other data sources has shown that um, there's been a substantial greening of the earth over the past few decades. And this particular study here says uh, CO2 fertilization effects explain about 70% of that greening trend. So um, the extra CO2 in the air whatever its effect on the climate, uh, it is having a beneficial effect on greening of the earth. And that also translates into higher agricultural productivity. And it's a global change. So um, the effects are seen um, all around the world and um, uh, it's including uh, things like the rice crop in Asia. And this is one uh, scientists back in the 90s didn't really expect CO2 to benefit rice, but the studies that have come out in the last few years have, have shown that it's actually had quite a positive impact on the rice crop in Asia. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, we don't have corresponding good things to point to with regard to particulates, for instance. If you have a year of really high particulate levels, it's not like there's a type of plant out there that benefits um, they're just a general nuisance, but CO2 does have this positive side effect. Okay. But what about the climate effects? Well, here we get into the problem that climate is a catch all term. And, um, I think most observers, including climate scientists would admit that a long, slow warming trend on its own isn't really a big problem. And it's just been lots of people researching this over the years that have said, you know, that's not really what we're concerned about. Might cause problems in some places, especially the areas that are already very hot and dry, probably not good for those places, but places like Canada, a lot of Northern hemisphere countries would actually get a slight benefit from longer growing seasons and, and milder weather and less harsh winters. So that's not what people are worried about here. The, they get talking about extreme weather events. And the problem is um, people are trying to link any bad weather that we observe to CO2 emissions so that they can then make a case that this is a crisis that we have to avoid at all costs. But there are problems with that argument. So if we look at hurricanes, for instance, uh, this is a, a data set on major hurricane frequency from uh, the early 1980s to uh, the present or to last year. Um, and the lower line is the major hurricane count and the upper line is all hurricanes. And you just can't see a, a trend there. That's anything at all in comparison to the natural variability of the, of the system. <clears throat> um, and this is despite all the glib rhetoric around hurricanes. Every time there's a hurricane, 
um, making landfall in the United States, the media is always rushing out to say, well, this is climate change and this is what climate change is doing. Well, no, um, you have had hurricanes making landfall on continental United States for as long as the continental United States has been sitting where it is. So this is not new. Um, and uh, this is another measure of um, a global measure of what's called um, accumulated cyclone energy. So taking all the cyclone activity together and measuring the amount of energy uh, in it over the long term. And this one goes back to uh, 1972. Again, you can see up and down movements, but there isn't a clear upward trend here. And um, people who want to say that the problem with global warming is we're going to have more severe tropical cyclones and, and hurricanes. Well, where's the data for that? Okay, you've had, uh, I've shown you um, a large increase in the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. In this case, I would just say, well, we're lucky, but it doesn't seem to have affected tropical cyclones. And it's a long enough record now that if there was going to be a, an effect, it should have shown up by now. Um, flooding. This is a, an area where the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had in its fifth assessment report very clear language on this. And in, in its special report on extreme weather is the same thing. Um, uh, in And this is a direct quote from the IPCC. In the United States and Canada during the 20th century and in the early 21st century, there is no compelling evidence for climate-driven changes in the magnitude or frequency of floods. And in Canada, our own government, at least the Environment Ministry, has admitted there's no evidence in our long term of increases in measures of extreme precipitation. Um, so here there's an enormous gap between what's in the expert literature and what the data shows versus what most politicians will say. When they get talking about climate change, they'll talk about droughts and floods and hurricanes and forest fires without showing you any data. And I could go through lots of data on those things and it'll just refute all that um, rhetoric. But let's suppose that there is a connection. Um, okay, so what if there's a connection between CO2 emissions? How do we do the calculations here? So imagine that in 1963, there'd been 10% less CO2 emitted. How would today's weather be different? Um, anyone who says they could calculate a precise answer to that question is fibbing. You just can't do it. It's the calculations would be impossible. Um, we can also say with certainty that if we cut CO2 emissions today, there's still going to be hurricanes and floods, drought, storms, forest fires, all that over the next hundred years. And it is for all practical purposes, impossible to say what the effects of the kinds of small cuts we're talking about, what they will be over the coming century. And I know there's a whole branch of literature now that likes to do these attribution analyses. And um, I just, I don't put much stock in them, first of all, because it's ambulance chasing. They only ever go looking for bad events. <clears throat> and then they claim to be able to say that, well, CO2 emissions made this 10% more likely or 15% more severe than it would have been. And well, okay, fine. If you say so, it's just, there's no way of checking those kinds of things. It's all model calculations. Then the other thing is they never look at whether there are any beneficial weather changes. You know, with, we had some nice weather this week in Ontario. Was that going to be a blizzard or a hurricane if except greenhouse gases intervened and gave us nice weather well nobody ever checks that out so they only ever look at bad weather events so the fact that they only ever find bad weather events obviously doesn't mean anything um so if we can't calculate the changes resulting from co2 emissions we can't put a, a value on them and what we can say though is whatever changes are we're talking about are going to be very small and a long time in the future. And because they're very small and very far in the future, that means um, the benefits of CO2 emission reduction policies uh, on any reckoning are going to be very small, although, and the costs are going to be very large. And 
um, this has been the the uh, unavoidable reality of climate policy now for 20 or 30 years, and it's not going to change. Um, it's not going to change unless the technology changes. And, and I should emphasize here that I'm saying everything based on current technology. If somebody came up with an inexpensive carbon dioxide scrubber, if there was something you could stick in your tailpipe that would capture the CO2 and turn it into a, a powder that could be safely disposed of, and the same thing for power plant smokestacks, this whole issue would go away. Then we would, fine, we'll adopt those technologies and um, uh, give them to third world countries free of charge, and we're done. Then we keep on using and getting the benefits of fossil fuels, but we stop the CO2 emissions. So if the technology came about, then that would be fine. But we're not in that world right now, so we have to deal with the world we live in. Now, the way economists try to think about the costs and benefits of climate policy, it's, it's based on a set of tools called integrated assessment models. And we use these to compute what's called the social cost of carbon, or the technical term is the marginal damages of CO2 emissions. And a very important assumption in these models, and these models are meant to project out over a century or two centuries of what the effects of the CO2 emissions would be, but also what the cost of trying to reduce the CO2 emissions would be. A very important assumption is called equilibrium climate sensitivity. And that's a parameter that's taken from climate models and is plugged into these integrated assessment models. Now, climate models have an equilibrium climate sensitivity of about three degrees. What that means is, um, in the model, if you double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the model says you'll get about three degrees of warming on average. You might, some models it's as low as one and a half degrees, other models it can be four and a half or five or even six degrees. But on average, they, they have about three degrees of warming from doubling the CO2 in the atmosphere. But there's a separate literature that has looked at the estimation of climate sensitivity based on historical data. And based on the numbers I've already shown you, showing that the actual atmosphere appears to warm up less than climate models think it, it should, um, those empirically estimated climate sensitivity numbers are less than the climate model numbers. So a few years ago, I worked with a couple of co-authors and we asked, well, what if we were to take the empirically estimated climate sensitivity numbers and put them into these integrated assessment models? And we, to do this, we use the integrated assessment models that the U.S. Environmental Agency uses. And we just redid their calculations, changed nothing at all about their models, except swapped in the empirically estimated climate sensitivity parameter. And so here's what happened. So this is the average social cost of carbon estimate out of uh, two of the models used by the Environmental Protection Agency using the standard climate sensitivity parameter. But when we dropped in the empirical climate sensitivity parameter, that social cost of carbon estimate drops quite a bit. Um, so uh, as of 2020, the number goes from about $30 a ton down to about $12 a ton. In a follow-up study, we also added some updated evidence on the benefits of CO2 fertilization in agriculture. And that red line drops even farther to the point where the social cost of carbon is, is, is basically zero until the middle part of, of this century. So where does that leave us? Um, re with regards to why CO2 emissions is re are really difficult to cut, um, what's run, why, why is it that after 30 years of concerted effort, we have really nothing to show for it? Well, first of all, the emissions mix globally. So unilateral action is useless. It's got to be global if it's going to be anything. And if you have policymakers saying, uh, well, you should really do your part locally, okay, uh, if you say so, but don't let them tell you that this is going to somehow fix anything globally. Um, unilateral local action here is just meaningless. Second, the carbon cycle adjusts very slowly, even in response to large emission changes. So nobody's talking about stopping climate change or, or stopping the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere. <clears throat> For better or worse, it's gonna be what it's gonna be. 
And for the most part, um, the choice that we confront is just um, whatever effects we think are going to happen with climate change and either the costs of ambitious policy or not bothering to incur those costs of ambitious policy. But it's not like there's a path ahead that involves no climate change. Or at least um, if there's no path ahead that involves no accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere, whatever that implies about um, climate change, big or small. Emissions are tied to fossil fuel use, which is essential for economic growth and development. And that's, again, with current technology. Under current technology, there's just no way that the world is going to develop, certainly no way for the developing countries to improve their lot without access to abundant fossil energy. And here, I, I am dismayed and I strongly oppose decisions of, of places like the European um, Bank for Reconstruction and Development and um, U.S. banks and others who are telling third world countries we're no longer going to finance fossil fuel based power plants. I mean, they need the electricity uh, and we used fossil fuel based power plants. So to pull up the drawbridge behind us here is, I think, very unethical. Um, China has, well, um, for one thing, that has driven all these countries into the arms of China. They've gone to China, signed up for the Belt and Road Initiative, and now a lot of these countries are becoming essentially client states uh, of Beijing. They're, um, they're dependent on Beijing for infrastructure funding, but China is also trying to court favor with the West by threatening to cut off funding for fossil fuel based uh, electricity developments in the third world. And, and uh, I just think this is extremely regrettable and highly unethical. Um, abatement options are very limited. That's, that's the technology issue that I've discussed. So if we're going to reduce CO2 emissions on a large scale at the global level, there's no getting around the fact that that means we're going to stop using fossil fuels, which means we're going to cut ourselves off from really our most abundant and reliable energy source. And that's something that's going to have massive negative economic consequences. And then when we try to tally up, what do we get out of all of this? Well, the effects are highly uncertain. They're typically overstated. I mean, the effects of, of CO2 emissions and the benefits of cutting CO2 emissions are unlikely to appear in any case for many decades into the future. So it is a difficult case to make uh, for people. Uh, and um, and that's, that's a substantive point. It's not just a case of, it's not like better communication or more clever PR is going to get around this. It's, it's difficult to actually tell people honestly that this is worth doing, given the underlying realities of the situation. So um, you can guess how all this discussion ends, climate policy keeps running up against reality. And uh, we're seeing this play out in real time. Right now, Europe and, and China and, and other countries are, because of some bad planning and some bad policy moves on their part, they've suddenly got a short term shortage of fossil fuels. And uh, those governments are uh, not happy about it, even though Supposedly, this is what they've been aspiring to. They've been mm -hmm. aspiring to cut fossil fuel use, but when it's actually happening, uh, they're panicking and trying to reverse course. And um, I, I think it's on the same theme. It's quite ironic that the same week that uh, your president, President Biden, announced that he wanted to pursue much more aggressive climate policy than the price of oil started going up and three days later he got on the phone to Saudi Arabia and begged them to increase oil production. Um, this is the collision that I, I'm talking about here, that climate policy keeps meeting reality and reality wins every time. So with that, Cal, I am going to uh, end my presentation and see if I can now get out of my slides without... Yep. Again, without crashing we're the internet set. here. We're all set. We're back to just you and me okay. here, at least as far as what anybody else can see. Uh, thank you very much, Ross. Um, that is, uh, I've, I've actually viewed uh, uh, another 
uh, source of that presentation a couple of times, but uh, each time I see it, I appreciate better how how helpful it is uh, for people to understand the kind of the the confounding factors on the entire uh, hope for uh, somehow or other uh, reigning in climate change, whatever that means, through policies uh, related to energy use. Uh, it's a, it's a quite a thing. Um, <clears throat> had a couple of quick questions before we sign off. Um, uh, at one point there, Ross, you said that, okay, now if we come up with some new technology that would enable us to just at, at very low cost, uh, remove the CO2 emissions from our use of uh, fossil fuels, um, then sure, yeah, we can go ahead and do that. And yet you've also uh, pointed out that there are some real benefits to added CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, even if we were to reach seven or 800 parts per million, uh, we would still be well below what uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere has been in some of the most verdant periods of Earth's geologic history. Uh, so even if it cost us essentially nothing to, to, uh, to reach you know, net zero, so to speak, of CO2 emissions, why would we really want to do that? Especially if, as uh, you and Dayaratna and Kreutzer uh, have, have shown, you can actually wind up with a negative social cost of carbon. That is, uh, uh, CO2 emissions do more benefit than harm. Uh, why would we do that? Um, yeah, I, I take your point. And I guess the way I would reply to that is um, if I felt that there was a really um, uh, fulsome, um, honest appraisal out there in the literature of the benefits of CO2, um, I think we would be in a position uh, to make to to gauge that trade off. Like, okay, suppose the device is invented, and then. You know, someone says legitimately, yeah, but all this CO2 is helpful for plants. The response to that's going to be, yeah, but a, an increase in CO2 on such a short time scale, like over a century scale to go from 400 to 1200 parts per million or something like, we're not going to go that high, but 400 to 700 parts per million. Um, that's, um, that has risks associated with it and we should just avoid it. Um, and with that, I would say um, my hunch is, based on the numbers that I've seen, we will see the low end of any climate change scenarios. And a lot of these damages are overstated. And um, also on the greening side, it's the opposite problem, that you have a real reluctance on the part of a lot of the scientists in the area to just come out and say, yeah, you know, it's beneficial for agriculture. It's beneficial for um, plants. And um, in that, that literature, when we were going through it, working on that, that paper that I mentioned, um, it's there, but the authors just seem really to be looking for any downside possible. Like, yeah, the plants grow better, but um, yeah, they get more starchy or they grow better, but it's stalks and leaves. It's not the, the fruit of the plant that benefits. So um, it's like there's um, there's got to be a downside to it. So I wouldn't feel like I'd be in a position to really form an opinion in the end on mm -hmm. is it is it realistically realistically a net benefit um, unless we had uh, just a, a more neutral objective set of information out there okay. to look at rather than yeah. this um this heavily spun um body of of information out there i mean we talked at the beginning about the problems with the ipcc that um, a lot of good information in there but where it matters it feels really spun and um yeah. or the stuff that's actually would feed into these decisions that's also the parts of the report that you feel 
the least able to trust. And um, so uh, given that, I would, um, and also given the, the fact that uh, the alternatives right now are really ruinous policies, um, government's making a lot of really bad decisions around climate policy, I would say, well, if we can get rid of that problem with a $5 device mm -hmm. that goes on your tailpipe, then let's just do the $5 device and be done with all the bad policies. <laughs> yeah, which which could really, uh, I suppose that it could save a whole lot of labor time that goes into pushing the whole climate agenda and put people into more productive work. <laughs> so, uh, yes, it'd be uh, a lot of people that would have to go out and do something useful for a living. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I just cringe when I think of the literally billions of dollars that governments spend just on climate modeling every single year and uh, how yeah. little progress we've made there. I mean, we, we, you would think that, that over the years, as you keep revising and improving climate models, the fit between modeled temperature and observed temperature would, would improve over time. And yet, as uh, Roy Spencer and John Christie have, have shown recently, uh, the sixth generation models are actually worse than the fifth generation models were, uh, which indicates that mm. we're pouring money down a rat hole, I guess. Uh, as, as a second question yeah, that... for you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, on that point, from the fourth generation to, or it was the actually third generation, they skipped one to the fifth generation, the models got worse at dealing with temperature extremes. Uh, moved, they moved closer to each other and farther away from the data. And then yeah. um, from the fifth to the sixth, um, that paper I mentioned, John Christie and I published, um, we showed that mm -hmm. what used to be a, a warm bias in the tropical atmosphere is now global. That, um, the models, every single model run that we looked at from every climate model overstates the observed warming in the global lower troposphere and the mid troposphere. And it's a, just a pervasive right. bias. It, as you say, it's, it's gotten worse, not better. And um, yeah. uh, that is a very poor return on investment for, um, for yeah. climate research. My other, uh, other question was uh, that right near the end there, you said that uh, cutting fossil fuel use would have and I believe these were the exact words you used, massive negative economic consequences. Now, uh, you know, you and I study a lot of economics and we can kind of talk economics, but most people I think don't speak economic ease. Uh, what does massive negative economic consequences mean in, in real concrete terms? Um, well, it's a bit of a hard question to answer because any time we've faced a serious disruption of our fossil energy supply, um, the immediate consequences are so harsh that governments really pull out the stops to uh, um, prevent the situation from developing. Um, in 1973, um, you and I are old enough to remember the OPEC oil crisis. Um, yeah. Uh, when the price of oil uh, suddenly went up quite dramatically and it looked like it wasn't going to come down anytime soon. And that caused a, uh, a recession, um, rise in unemployment and a, a, a large drop in economic activity. It actually changed the growth path for Western countries for a long time. There was, there was a a slowdown in the growth of productivity that lasted for many decades after that. It's been a feature of macroeconomic analysis, this change at 1973. Um, after that, um, when, well, countries put a lot of effort into diversifying their supply of oil and so that we aren't beholden to any one region in the same way. Um, uh, if, for for countries like Canada and the United States, um, if the price of energy goes up substantially, um, the typical impact here is a recession. You, know, you have um, a bump up 
of three or four percent of unemployment and they'd have a year of, of hardship, reduced incomes. Um, people spending more on energy means less money for everything else. But eventually measures get taken to restore the supply of energy, get prices down, people get back to work. Um, we don't. So these are temporary shocks. What the climate crowd is looking at would be something like a permanent COVID lockdown world where um, mm -hmm. you don't have access to motor vehicle transportation unless you're able to afford an electric car or you use public transit. Um, and you don't have access to um, gas heating for your house. You have to switch to electricity. I mean, there are cities now that have already started to ban the use of natural gas yeah. for any future urban developments. Um, as part of this net zero drive. Um, well, the other options are extremely expensive. Uh, you know, in, in Ontario, electricity is becoming very expensive. The price has just about tripled um, since the early part of the last decade. And a lot of that is due to environmental policy moves by the government that um, cut off access to low cost electricity and bound us to very expensive contracts for renewables. Um, I've mentioned Europe a couple of times. They're going through an energy crisis right now. Um, they, through bad planning and longstanding environmental policies, climate policies, they have shut down. Well, Britain is all but shut down its natural gas development. And um, similarly, Netherlands closed down early a uh, productive natural gas field. And I think they thought we don't need it because we're building all these wind turbines. And then they've discovered this year when they needed the electricity, the wind wasn't blowing. And suddenly they have to fire up of all things, these old coal fired power plants. But then uh, where do they get the coal from? They have to turn to Russia and China. And but there's high demand for coal in those places. So they can't get the supplies yeah. they need and they haven't built up their stores of liquefied natural gas and other uh, gas sources. So they're heading into the, the winter months with historically very low supplies of fossil energy. And as a result, um, if you look at the, the prices of natural gas in Europe, they've just gone parabolic. They're, they're through the ceiling. And um, so the energy companies, the, the, the marketers, a lot of them have just declared bankruptcy. They, they can't afford to get the fuel to supply to households. So you'll get to see yeah. in real time what um, the economic consequences are of um, I, I think what climate I, what policies. I want to do, what I, what I want to do is to kind of get away from sort of dollar figures and the, thing, the kinds of things that you would see in a, in a financial manager's spreadsheet or something and get to, okay, what does this look like in people's lives? And one of the illustrations of that uh, over the last decade and a half was the increase in, uh, in excess premature winter deaths in Britain, in Germany, several other places that had done huge uh, switches from coal and natural gas, electrical, electric generation to wind or solar. And the consequence was that the prices rose a lot for energy at the consumer level. And so more and more consumers uh, couldn't afford in the winter to keep their homes adequately warm. And so you had uh, in Britain over about an eight year period, you had more than a doubling of excess premature winter deaths. So what we're really talking about in terms of massive negative economic consequences is real suffering of real human beings um, mm -hmm. uh, that that just are not just a matter of uh, ticks on a spreadsheet, you know. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think that's what you're warning of. Uh, and I just wanted to try to make it a little more concrete. Well, do you have any uh, closing comments for us, Ross, uh, before we be, before we finish off here? Well, I think we've covered uh, a lot of ground. I should probably leave it at that. Um, and uh, right. I hope um, 
I hope your uh, your members found it informative and um, that they will uh, stay active on this topic because um, if you don't want bad and misguided policy, then you have to be prepared to speak up. Yeah. Amen. And that's exactly what you've been doing for a good long time, Ross. Thank you very, very much for all that you've done. You are one of the best sources of information I know in this field. And I, I go frequently to rossmckittrick.com and uh, read your, your uh, writings there. Great stuff. And you write frequently for a number of different periodicals uh, and much appreciated. So thank you very, very much. Thanks, Folks, thanks again for joining us this evening. Uh, next week, as I mentioned before, uh, we will have another uh, guest on the program. This will be John McGinnis, John O. McGinnis, and we'll be discussing his book, Blinded Not by Science. Now, there's, there's a, a technical term in logic called blinding with science, where uh, you just simply pile up a whole bunch of technical terms so as to intimidate somebody so that he doesn't dare argue with you anymore. No, McGinnis's book is called Blinded by Scientism. And that's the substitute of a sort of a naive faith in the greatness of science, uh, the unquestionability of science. And uh, McGinnis has done a, a great job in showing how scientism has undermined real science in our world and what are some of the, uh, the really negative consequences of that for all of life. So thank you again for joining us tonight. Uh, one more time, I'd like to mention to you that uh, for the month of October, uh, when you make a 100% tax deductible donation to the Cornwall Alliance of literally any size, uh, and ask for it, we would be delighted to send you a free copy of my brand new book, Biblical Foundations for Economics. Uh, this uh, applies biblical principles uh, in terms of ethics and theology, as well as biblical insights about uh, very, very simple matters, such as the importance of, of looking to the future, planning ahead, uh, and so on. Uh, this book, uh, we would love to send to you free. To request your copy, just go to cornwallalliance.org, cornwallalliance.org, and click on the Donate button. And while you're filling out the donation form, when you come to the Comments field, simply write in uh, promo code 21-10, promo code 21-10, and the title Biblical Foundations for Economics. We'll be delighted to send you a copy. Thanks again for joining us this evening. Look forward to seeing you next week.